So what I want to talk about today is some of the new opportunities that we're seeing. Opportunities where we now finally can engineer biology the way we engineer other areas. So let, let me start from the very, very beginning. Let's start from the origin of life. You know, if you think about the origin of life and you know, creation of single cell organisms, multicellular organisms, aquatic life forms, fish, amphibians crawling out of the, out of the water, uh, reptiles, T-Rexes, little mice, um, uh, dolphins going back in the water, primates, apes, and humans. Evolution has created a ton of features. It's an amazing software engineer of sorts. But you know, with these features come bugs. For instance, like we get cancer. A lot of simple organisms just don't get cancer. They have mechanisms to fight that. We get Alzheimer's. We get PTSD and other behavioral issues and type 2 diabetes. So you know, there's this uh, sort of dichotomy of features and bugs. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like software engineering, right? When we think about it from software engineering, usually there's a major culprit that's involved. And this is the concept of technical debt. So you know, technical debt is this issue that we have to deal with in software all the time. This issue that we're trying to get an MVP out. It's not going to be perfect. We don't have time to make it perfect. And so we're going to make some compromises with the coding. And it's going to work, but it, you know, we're going to have trouble. And if you think about it, biology is all about technical debt. Biology is trying to get that MVP out. You're trying to like, survive the T-Rex coming after you. you know, you're not going to be able to make things perfect. And so you know, and part of the challenge that we have to deal with with understanding biology and fixing biology and handling healthcare is dealing with all that technical debt. So you might wonder, well, well how can we do that? And maybe an even deeper question is, how can we learn from what software has told us? So perhaps let's actually go to my favorite and probably the most impressive example of technical debt, both in terms of the mountain to climb and our ability to fix it, Y2K. So you guys remember Y2K, right? I remember, you remember the predictions that you know, planes were going to fall out of the sky, the energy grids would come out, they'd be rioting, cats and dogs sleeping with each other. It was going to be like an apocalypse of biblical proportions, right? Except the apocalypse never happened. Like, what happened? Well, let's step back. What was the apocalypse? What was the problem? The problem is that you know, in, when people were coding software in the you know, 1957 or 1967 or 1973, two digits for the year was perfectly fine. In fact, like you know, 2000, that sounds like something out of Arthur C. Clarke or Stanley Kubrick. That's like way in the future. We don't have to worry about that. And frankly, on my 8-bit machine, two bytes is pretty big. So I'm not going to have four bytes for the date. OK, but then what happens is that the year 2000 co starts coming upon us, and we've got all this old COBOL code, all this code that nobody understands, this mess. And we have to do two things. We have to get in the code, somehow figure it out and understand it, understand the mess of spaghetti code that's there. And then we have to fix it and engin engineer fixes. And I think you might be seeing where I'm going with this, is that that's a lot like what we have to do in biology. You know, we have to get into the code, which is a mess, and understand it. And just understanding the code of biology is something extremely difficult. But then once we've done that, that's when the opportunity comes. That's the opportunity for us to come in and engineer new fixes and avoid Y2K-like problems in our healthcare. OK, so what does biology look like? Well, let me show you some examples of biology code of sorts. So what you're looking at is a biological circuit. This is a bunch of biochemical reactions that put together work very much like a, any other electronic circuit we might be talking about. And so this is an oversimplified part, a part of metabolism that is part of actually a larger part of metabolism that if we, so if we you know, zoom out of this, hopefully you get a sense that there's no way any of us can wrap our head around this mess. It's big, complicated, messy. And when you talk to a biologist, and I think what we're starting to realize is that there's a fundamental conclusion that comes from this, is that biology is so complicated that it's probably beyond what the human being can understand. And, and that's actually part of this huge mess, is that it's not something very transparent for us to deal with. And that's really limited how we can handle biology and how we handle healthcare. What's different now, though, is actually a new entrant onto the scene. And this is artificial intelligence. So what we're seeing is the ability for artificial intelligence to be able to learn things in ways that we can't, and to learn without human interaction. A great example, I don't know if you guys have seen this, is AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero learned from playing from other Go computers. And the key thing about AI in general and how I would differentiate AI from traditional machine learning is that it can learn features, it can learn um, things on its own without human interaction. 
So where does that come in in terms of biology? Well, if we can't understand biology from tons of data, maybe uh, artificial intelligence can. And what I want to do is maybe walk you through a little bit of how this works. And especially, for example, if you want to understand something very fundamentally important in biology, let's say, does a patient have cancer? And what cancer do they have? How can we do that identification? Well, it turns out that identification is very similar to identifying someone in a picture. And so let's go to a simple example that might be common to some of you of how AI recognizes images. And so the typical approach that people use here is a so-called deep learning approach. It's deep because we've stacked layers of neural networks deep amongst each other. And what that layering gets us is it gets us the ability for AI to learn more and more complicated concepts. So if we feed it images, what AI will first start with is um, start with the pixels from an image. It'll then go up to a higher level concept of shapes. You know, we didn't have to tell it about shapes, it discovered shapes. It then at the next higher level, it'll discover features. So if you give it faces, pictures of faces as its data, it'll start to find noses and eyes and mouths and ears. You go up one step further, it'll start to build sort of prototype faces. And then for identification, you'll be able to say, look, okay, you give me this picture, I know this is Dave, some specific face. And the key thing here is that this is reproducible. We just gave it data for faces, but I could give it data for anything. We could give it data for cars, for elephants, for chairs, it's the same process. Okay, so where does this connect to biology? Well, in biology, I don't, want, I don't need to identify chairs and cars. I want to identify from someone's blood a reading of their immune system, the DNA in their blood right now, what does that tell me about cancer? And so I don't want to read images, I want to read DNA. But actually it's kind of similar. You can imagine that the input is going to be DNA bases. We go up a level, we start to sort of understand how these bases interact into edges, genetic aberrations, possible diagnoses. And then finally we could say from a given patient's blood that this patient has ovarian cancer by detecting what the immune system is reading out this moment. So the hypothesis here and the opportunity is that this is something that we could do considerably with AI, considerably more accurate than people. But, you know, so hopefully you get some sense of how this could work, but, you know, the deep question is, does it work? How do we know that this is more than just words, more than just like an idea? And what I would argue is that there's a statistical, numerical proof of how well it works. And that's in comparing the AI test to the traditional test. So traditional diagnostics, which typically are derived from an oversimplified version of biology that a human came up with, something that was limited by human understanding and so therefore not perfect. You know, typical diagnostics have maybe about 50% accuracy. PSA test has 50% accuracy. Identifying colorectal cancer from blood, also about 50% accurate. So it's interesting to ask, you know, how could it do better? And what we're seeing is companies like Freenome that look for the signals for cancer from blood can do considerably better, you know, 90% and plus. But this isn't just limited to just genomics and cancer. This is something where uh, other companies can apply the same scheme to other data sets. So cardiogram can take wearable information and predict atrial fibrillation with 97% accuracy. And actually, uh, this game plan we're seeing in, uh, across the board, and it leads to really astounding results. I think the cardiogram one, for me, is particularly astounding because most people would say that the Apple Watch could never detect something that you could do, need an AKJ for. It just doesn't have the hardware. It's, it's missing something uh, that an EKG has. But I think due to uh, what Cardiogram has done, it's, they've shown that the missing piece is not more hardware, but is software. The missing piece is artificial intelligence and gold standard data sets that can take what the Apple Watch can do and, and make high quality predictions. And so this is something that we're seeing across the board. And the opportunity here is that with AI, we can go far beyond what we could do before with humans alone. Okay, so then this leads to like the question that then everyone is worrying about, which is like, am I gonna to go to the doctor and I'm gonna see a robot or something like that, or are computers gonna replace doctors? It's clear that in many areas, we've seen in dermatology, ophthalmology, many different areas, that computers can be more accurate than doctors in predicting. In many ways, what they can do is they can almost be like the wisdom of the crowds. They can be as good or better than the very best doctors together. But of course, it's never gonna be computers versus doctors. It's a false dichotomy, it's a false comparison. It's always gonna be doctors and computers. And naturally, they would be better than computers or doctors alone. And I think this is the future of healthcare. And so, you know, for fun, we can actually really start to rethink how we even think of the letters AI. This is not about an artificial intelligence, this is about the augmented intelligence of doctors using AI together. Okay, so the final question you may have is like, why now? What's special about now? And I think, 
from my point of view, there's three key trends that have come together. The first one is just the rise of AI. AI is so ubiquitous, it's so easy to start. Um, it's a very natural time, a very special time in our history. But secondly, AI alone is not gonna do it. Without data, these algorithms really could not do anything. And so the availability of data is a second key part. Then finally, there's the ability to go after really meaningful problems, going after cancer, heart disease, diabetes. These are some of the biggest killers that we have to deal with in the country. And so it's not just something where this is acute academic problem, this is something that could go right at the, at the center of our biggest challenges in healthcare. And so put together, what we've seen now is a sea change in how we can handle things. That biology is no longer limited by human understanding. And in, you know, in the Y2K technical debt analogy, we can go through the COBOL code and figure things out. It's a bit of a mess, but we now have the tools in place to do that. So now the second point is like, well, let's, let's actually make some fixes. And so in the second half of my talk, what I want to talk about is how we would use that type of understanding to engineer biology. Okay, so first off, engineering is a loaded word. People often hear different things, so I want to make sure we're on the same page for what we mean by engineering. When I think about engineering, I'm going to contrast that with empiricism. So, you know, my favorite examples is like bridges versus drugs. So like we engineer bridges, we discover drugs. You know, imagine a world where we like discovered bridges the way we discovered drugs. You know, we wouldn't build one bridge, we'd build like 10,000 bridges, right? And then we'd see which one we think works best. And then the one we're confident about would put through bridge clinical trials. And we'd put mice over the bridge to see if like the, the bridge survives and the mice are fine. And then if that looks good, we'll probably put people who really need to cross the bridge over the bridge and see if that works and then we'll be fine. And if the bridge fails, we'll blame you know, regulatory agencies because the, because the bridge is a problem. Well, in reality, you know, that would never work. It would be actually, it would be crazy. Like if the San Francisco Bay Bridge collapsed, this billion dollar bridge collapsed, it would be a scandal. Someone would go to jail. Compare that to drugs, like a billion dollar drug fails clinical trials. I mean, that's like every week. That, I think, really hits home the difference between engineering and discovery science risk. And so what we want to do is work on things that are in this engineering area. Okay, well, so, you know, you may think, well, aren't we doing that already? And, you know, biology has come a long way, but actually if you go to, you know, the top labs at Stanford or Harvard or MIT or UCSF, for the most part, a lot of science has not changed. It's brilliant people at benches, uh, rows and rows of benches, doing manual labor, pipetting, almost like pre-industrial revolution. And the big, big advance was robots. And so robots really is just not engineering, it's just faster people. You can get to your 1,000 or 10,000 chances just faster. What we want to do is something different, something where you don't make 10,000, you make one, two, or three, and that works. To give you a sense of the scale of where this type of engineering approach can be applied, I want to give you a brief tour. To get that scale, I'm going to start small and go all the way big. We're going to start with cells, then move to engineering human behavior and engineering organisms, then talking about engineering healthcare systems themselves, and finally, and maybe even a bit philosophically or grandly with um, engineering the very premise of healthcare. So let's start with cells. So I showed you this example of a cell before, that, you know, this big mess of things. You know, you may ask, or may think, we'll never be able to engineer anything as complicated as this. I mean, it's, it's just a mess, right? It's so sophisticated. But I would argue we're already engineering things like this. A typical microprocessor, and this is like the IBM Z10, you know, a typical microprocessor has literally billions and billions of transistors, you know, deep into Carl Sagan transistor territory. And clearly no human being did this by hand. And so the question is, how can we do something this complex, and could we learn from what we do here to other areas? So here we use electronic design automation, EDA tools. And the way these EDA tools work is that we code up the circuit, typically in, in a language like Verilog. We then build the design, and then we test it. You know, not every chip that we design is perfect, but it's not like we need to make 10,000 of them and cross our fingers for one to work. You build one or two or three, and generally you have something that works. What's intriguing is that um, bioengineers from MIT have written a software called Cello, which allows them to do exactly the same thing for biochemical circuits. You first code the circuit, in this case, in the very same language, in Verilog, the same language you'd use to code electronic circuits. You would design it, and then you test it. And one of the most impressive things in their paper that they've shown is that they can predict the accuracy through software, much like the way EDA tools work for electronic circuits. They can predict with 90% accuracy. 
What that means is that you build one, 99 out of 10 times is gonna work, you build two, 99 out of 100 times one is gonna work, you build three, 999 out of 1,000 is gonna work. It's something where this is not like make 10,000 and cross your fingers. This is something where we can really engineer them. Okay, so you might wonder, well, why do I need to engineer cells? What are we gonna do with engineered cells? Well, right now, cells are really important in biotechnology. Cells are little factories manufacturing proteins. Seven out of the top 10 drugs right now that are sold are protein drugs made by cells. Genentech spends about $2 billion a year making proteins. If you could make this 10% better, that's $200 million straight there. Far less for the biological maximum, theoretical maximum, maybe 10 times better, decreasing cost from 2 billion to 200 million. That's a simple example, like an immediate go to market, but you can also imagine like with all the great things that people are doing to engineer cells as therapies in CAR T, we can actually have, and we're starting to see emerge, a new type of therapeutic where cells actually are the therapy. The engineering that people are doing there are very primitive, very much by hand. The ability to engineer with circuit design like this is kind of like going from the 4004 microprocessor, which was done by hand, to a roadmap where we can get to something like a Pentium or a Z10. So, so that's an example from cells. Let's, let's go up a level. Let's talk about organisms. So you know, when I talk about evolution and all the technical debt, I mentioned all the bugs. And one bug is behavioral diseases like PTSD, anxiety, depression, and, and type 2 diabetes. And these problems, I connect with technical debt because it's not as simple as making an antibiotic. An antibiotic, you go after one protein, you hit it, and you're done. That's why antibiotics work so beautifully. Depression isn't really about one protein causing it. It's not a simple, simple one, a sort of circuit that you can go after. It's a mess. And not surprisingly, there's no drug that cures you the way an antibiotic does. No drug where you take the drug for a week and you're no longer depressed for life. What we're starting to realize is there's such a complicated system that probably a drug may not be the, the best approach. So if you look at the efficacy of a drug here compared to a placebo, and actually in this graph, up and to the right's bad. This is like the incidence of diabetes. So you want down and to the right. The drug does have some efficacy. But what we're starting to realize is that there are other approaches that have no toxicity and greater efficacy. Approaches that use existing behavioral therapies. And so this is uh, an area where Amada is leading the charge. Amada has a behavioral therapy, which is in a sense similar to areas like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, derived from the CDC's diabetes prevention program. And Omada can demonstrate efficacy that actually exceeds that of metformin. And I might wonder, like, how is that possible? And how did they engineer that? Well, the way they can engineer this is that Omada can have a therapy that they can iteratively improve, engineered the way Google would improve its search algorithm. You can't iterate a drug like a search algorithm because you make a new iteration of the drug, it might kill people. It'd have to go through clinical trials. But for a digital therapeutic like this, you can iterate week after week doing A-B testing, which in the medical world is really a randomized clinical trial that you get to run every week. You make it better and better and better and engineer it and improve it to the point where you can have efficacy that increases and increases with a data network effect. Okay, so let's continue the tour and, and step up one more level. Let's talk about the healthcare system. So, you know, in, in your copious spare time, I urge you to read a brief history of the healthcare system, especially for those of you that are curious, it's amazing. The healthcare system wasn't really designed, it essentially evolved over time, almost like it's its own biological organism. You know, it started in the early days where doctors came to our house, then we had hospitals, then we had um, unions and AMA, and then insurance companies to pay for things, and then finally sort of modern medicine with x-rays and, and, and drugs and therapies, which then of course leads to more in pay, need to pay for Medicare, and then more recently new models of payments like HMO and capitation. These are features that came along, but not from a clean slate design, very much with a lot of technical debt and adding things on metaphorically. And you may ask, well, what's the consequence of this technical debt? Well, one of the most dramatic consequences is a huge amount of health waste. There's nobody quarterbacking a, a lot of healthcare, or at least quarterbacking healthcare is really hard to do healthcare coordination. And so this is where um, one can engineer solutions, and Patient Ping is leading the charge here to engineer health, healthcare solutions for coordination through actually a very elegant mechanism. What they can do is they can provide messaging or pings that are transparent to the patient that lets payers and providers know uh, where their patients are. And so where this can help a lot with um, healthcare waste is that often people go to the emergency room, which is crazy expensive, instead of simpler things. So I know for myself, I've got all these knee issues. You know, If I were going to the emergency room two or three times a, uh, a month, 
I could see that why if I just didn't know what to do, I, could, I would be in so much pain, I, might, I need to do that. It'd be much better for me to go to PT. With something like patient ping, your payer will know what's happening, will see your use of emergency room, will encourage you to get to PT, will know whether you're going to PT. This is both better for costs and, and health waste, and frankly, it's better for efficacy and better for the patients. And I gave PT as an example. Mental health is also a great example where mental health therapy is so much cheaper than the emergency room treatments. And so this is a, a beginning for where patient ping can add value, but the data set that they generate, the knowledge where a patients are at any given time the treatments are getting, is such a great network that one can build on features on top of this uh, for many new apps to come. Okay, so finally, to, to finish the tour, I want to talk about sort of one step higher, which is the fundamental way we think about healthcare. And so in thinking about that, you know, we call healthcare healthcare, but it's kind of a misnomer. Healthcare is not healthcare. Healthcare is sick care. When you're healthy, all my doctor friends would say the best thing to do is stay away from a doctor, stay away from the hospital, stay away from drugs, stay away from everything. But even if you're, you're doing everything the best you can and getting diet and exercise, you're still going to get sick eventually, especially since just with age, as you get older, the incidence of heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's just skyrockets. And you know, there's nothing you could do about aging. Well, actually, you know, let's, let's think about it for a second. If you could do something about aging, think about how that would change the world. For something like Alzheimer's disease, the leading drug delays Alzheimer's disease by like half a year or three quarter of a year. If you could slow down aging by 50%, you would be able to delay Alzheimer's by 40 years. If you could slow it down 100%, you could delay Alzheimer's by 80 years. Okay, I mean, I know this sounds like science fiction, but actually we're starting to realize that with recent science breakthroughs, this is now shifting from the world of science actually to the world of engineering. So the science breakthrough that's come up is that scientists, through looking at mice, have discovered that there's something in the blood of young mice, something in the blood of the young, that can engender healing properties, re rejuvenation properties in, in the old, to the point where you can injure the knee or the foot of the old one, and as long as it has the blood from the younger one, it can heal the foot and actually have youthful phenotype and even extension in age. So that's really amazing. And actually, some of you may have seen it's gotten, it's, this concept has been sort of everywhere. You've seen it in magazines like Science and Nature or TV shows like Silicon Valley uh, with a Blood Boy episode. You know, some people are talking about actually distributing human blood from the young to the old, having 100 million young people providing blood for 100 million old people, maybe at scale. That sounds like a very bad idea to me uh, on, in many ways. What we should do is figure out what is it in the blood that's engendering this effect. Now we're back to the same problem we had in the beginning. Like, we are so bad at looking at that type of data as human beings understanding what it is. On the other hand, machine learning is great at this. And so if you think about the, the game plan that Freenome runs for taking blood and understanding whether there's cancer and what's the cancerous agents in there, what BioAge is doing is doing essentially the same thing, looking at the blood of, of, of young, using machine learning to understand what is in it that could lead to diagnostics and potentially to therapeutics as well. I've given you a tour of like the full range of things. You know, in, in 25 minutes, there's only so much we can talk about, but uh, you know, this is a topic very dear to our hearts. And I think what we expect to see is the shift from many areas that used to be areas of science risk through engineering mechanisms and machine learning now become really engineering problems. With that in mind, we can finally understand and tackle the technical debt that biology have to deal with. You know, not through sort of this discovery mechanism that traditionally biology has done and medicine has done, but really through engineering itself. Thank you very much.